Sex offenders tend to be males, all ages, on up to geriatric ages. Um, I mentioned this before, but many times with 60% of the a family member, so we add on another 25%, somebody the child knows and is expected to trust. We have recent increases in adolescent sex offenders. I'm kind of referring to the scenario where we're seeing sibling abuse that's going on. Um, I feel, I think we need to research, but I feel that it's related to media and internet. Um, Violence is increasing too. Violence is on the media and internet. So I think it's reflective of the kinds of things they have access to. Um, sometimes when I have this situation like that, I'm able to identify with mother that the adolescent male has spent a lot of time on their computer and that maybe she's caught him on some porn sites. And I think when they're viewing this, they're dealing with physical and emotional feelings that they want to take out on somebody. So this is the person they turn to is perhaps their sibling. So I think the more we expose our kids to that, the greater the types of behaviors we should expect. Um, so I'm a child abuse pediatrician. I'm not a sex offender therapist. But what makes sense to me is when I think of the types of people that abuse or sexually abuse kids is to think of them as molesters and rapists. And when we're dealing with children, about 80% fit that molester type of uh, profile and 20% of rapists. So we'll talk about what that means. But first, this is a, a, a picture that a little girl drew many years ago, um, drew for her therapist. She was asked to write a letter to a perpetrator. And I'm going to read this to you because I think it will make some of you smile because you read this. Um, so she says, hey, you ugly man, I'm not afraid of you. I don't want you to hurt other kids because you'll be in bigger trouble. If you hurt other kids more, you will really go to jail. You're an ugly, mean old man. You look like a dog. This is what you look like. You know, and this is a wonderful example of anger. It's a wonderful example of a situation where a child knows I'm not at fault. That person's fault. The tragedy is that only about 8 or 10% of kids feel this. They're more likely to be confused, more likely to be sad, more likely to be ashamed than angry. I like it when they get to that point, because I feel like they're on the road. <laughs> but it takes a while for some of these kids to feel this way. OK, so molesters and rapists. So molesters initiate the abuse slowly. It's not uncommon for them to begin, for them to test the waters. And they do that by accidentally on purpose touching, maybe during bathing, maybe during wrestling or tickling fights. And they kind of gauge the child's reaction to that touch. If the child jumps up and runs away and says, what are you doing? That's probably not a good victim. But if you have a child who's more acquiescent, Okay, goes along with it, doesn't seem to react, keeps, keeps the activity going, that's somebody who might make a better victim. So it's a way of, of you know, getting a sense of who would make a good victim. They use enticement and deception to gain access. It's what they do to their mind. and try to deceive them into enjoying the experience. They want a relationship with the child. They want something that's ongoing, not a one-time thing. Everything they do is for that goal. Medical evidence is uncommon. They need to be gentle with their victims. Because a tear or a bruise, a child might complain, and the mother might bring them to the doctor. And who knows whether the doctor will see something or not, but it's a risk they can't take. So they will be gentle. They will move slowly. Rapists are what we're used to dealing with when we think of sexual assault. There's a lot of overlap between molesters and rapists. So rapists, they're all about what they need. They don't care whether the child enjoys the experience. In fact, they prefer if the child had some anxiety or pain. That's what they would prefer. So penetration is something that might occur earlier with rapists. They use force and control. And pain is part of what they're seeking. Um, Medical evidence might be more likely, but only if they come in within a few days of that sexual abuse or assault. 
So maybe 20 to 30 percent, if they come in within 48 hours, will have some kind of physical evidence if they were assaulted at the penetrative event. So um, victims of rapists are more likely to report earlier because it hurts, <laughs> okay, or because they have symptoms perhaps, than uh, victims of molesters in general. But make no mistake, there are a lot of people out there who are chronic rapists of children. In other words, we have, sometimes we have people saying things like, I made you, you're mine, I would do with you what I want. That's what one father said to his daughter. You belong to me, and I would do what I want. So there's a lot of disregard, you know, for the victim's feelings or comfort. So that can happen. So there is some, it's not a clear dichotomy here. In general, sex offenders of children are more likely than not to be physically violent with children and adult partners they live in. There's a lot of overlap between sexual abuse and physical violence. It's not uncommon for domestic violence to be in that same home. And it's not uncommon for the person who's battering the adult female in the home to also be sexually abusing the child. Use drugs or alcohol and victimize more than one child. It's so this is more likely than not. So this means about half of the sex offenders that are identified uh, or more will have these other problems. Now we're going to look at goals for sex offenders. So what do they want? And again, my qualifier here is that this is not my specific area of expertise. This information and knowledge is coming from reading a little bit, but also listen to what children tell me about the relationships that abusers might have with them. Sexual gratification, a sense of power and control, but also they want continued access to the victim, and they need the right kind of kid for that. They need somebody who's going to keep quiet, um, and they need to find ways to secure the silence, so we're going to talk about that. Um, some sex offenders have a preferred gender, preferred age, this tends to be more clearly described in the literature where you look at adults that use child pornography and what they're looking at, what their preference. They tend to have very specific preferences, and sometimes that's true for sex offenders as well. They need an accessibility to the child, uh, but they also need someone who's going to keep the secret, who will be vulnerable. And it's a balance of terror. So what these individuals are often looking for, that they need the victim to fear the consequences of disclosure. So they need them to be quiet, but not necessarily fear the abuser, because they want this complicit relationship with the child. So it is, a, it is a, sometimes a tenuous balance that they set out to achieve. Um, they need the victim to cooperate, silence. And how do they do this? Well, the best way to keep children quiet is to cultivate their fears, their guilt, and their shame as it relates to the abuse. We're going to look at each one because we hear about this all the time when we talk with our kids um, at Center for Miracles. So first is fear, and this is very common, but it's not fear perhaps that they're going to be hurt, it's fear that other people in the family are going to be hurt physically, or integrity-wise, breaking up of the family, that's what really makes victims fearful. Victims are very good at thinking of everybody else but themselves. It's really evident. They just, it, and sometimes they tell you, I let him abuse me so he wouldn't abuse my sister. They put themselves out there. Or you ask them, do you think this happened to anyone else? I know it didn't happen to anyone else. Because my sister was never with him. I never let that happen. That's the kind of thing that's very common. It's the mindset of a victim. Um, so they worry about physical, emotional harm to themselves, but often, more often to the family members, sometimes to the abuser. So about a third of these kids still love the person doing this to them. They're very ambivalent. About half of the kids we see are afraid that they're not going to be believed when they tell. That's a little better now than it was years ago because community is more receptive and open and there are more programs, so they know the kids are telling and talking about this, but it still is an issue for a lot of our victims, fear of not being believed. Um, 
Some of the problem with this is it's kind of easy for me to understand how this becomes a problem because what happens? Okay, the eight-year-old girl goes up to her mother and says, Mom, I have something to tell you. My stepdad has been abusing me for the last year. Now, some very supportive, well-intentioned mothers would sometimes, the first thing out of their mouth is, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me before this? We've talked about this. We've talked. I've told you, whenever somebody touches your bottom, you need to come tell me. If anybody does something, you see how that compound? It, it's a little bit of an extension of this theme, but this is a fear for the child. Will they believe me? Now, when a mother says, why didn't you tell me? What the child processes is, is she might believe me, but she's mad at me because I didn't tell them this is my fault. That's how they process that information very often. They're also afraid of being blamed, afraid of being told it's their fault, and sometimes perpetrators feed right into that. Don't tell, or your mother's going to be mad at you. Sometimes they're told, so they have those deceptions. Fear of disappointing parent, family, community, and we'll talk about this in a minute, a little more, and fear of losing their family. Okay, I mean, there's this, this belief that if something like this happens, report it to CPS, where everybody knows CPS takes kids immediately out of the home. That's the perception they have. And of course, that's not true most of the time, but that's what they believe might happen. And that's what's most important, is what they believe and what they perceive. So specifically, this is what they say to us when we ask, what are you afraid of? I'm, what if my mom doesn't believe me? What if they get mad at me for waiting so long? What if I get put in foster care? What if he or his family comes after me or my family? Family wars? Family feuds? What if I take my mom's happiness away? What if my little sister loses her daddy? These are really troublesome questions. It really uh, points to a term that I, I really think uh, captures this well, paradoxical responsibility. Again, imagine being eight or nine years old and being responsible for keeping your family together. And you know you hold that key. All you have to do is be quiet. <laughs> Another quote. I didn't want to tell because when I told the first time I was abused, it ruined everything. It took all my mother's happiness away. The kids don't want to be responsible for that. Young kids especially are very sensitive to this. And those of you who had these kids, you've seen this, right? Let's say, you know, as a mother, I know when my boys were small, if I was crying about something, it could be a TV program. What do they do? They come up to you, don't cry, Mom. Don't cry. They try to take your tears away. They're very protective. They don't, even if the distress is for them, they still want to get rid of it. They still want to fix it. So what do abusers say to try to reinforce some of these fears? If you tell, I will hurt you. If you tell, I will go to jail, and that would be your fault. You'll be in trouble. I would tell them you wanted it, that it's your fault. You'll be taken away to a shelter. You break up the family, and no one will believe you, or just simply don't tell. So, you know, sometimes there'll be a scenario where the, perfect, the abuser is removed from the home. Okay, and we all feel that the mother is being supportive, but sometimes some other things go on at home, and these cause a lot of trauma for the child. This is an example. I don't know if my mom believes me. At night, everyone is crying. My mom doesn't know who to believe, and my little sister and brother cry for their father. Again, tremendous pressure on a girl of 10. So how do they reinforce these fears? We talked about explicit threats, um, but we also have implicit threats where nothing has to be said. It's just there. The child knows they're not supposed to tell. How do we do this? Well, sometimes the perpetrator is somebody in a position of power. It might be a camp counselor. It might be a teacher. It might be a religious figure. It could be any of those individuals. I have. Um, been involved with some of those cases and find it very interesting to see or to hear how bold some of those scenarios are. You may have, um, there was a trial recently of a teacher involved in sexually abusing kids in the classroom, in front of other kids. 
But the way that seating in the classroom was, is it was a, all the, all the uh, desks were along the edge facing the wall. So he would go from student to student. He set this thing up so he could reach under and touch them while he was helping them on the computer as they were doing their homework. Um, another case I was involved with involved a camp counselor. And he would do shower checks on these young adolescent boys. He would make them take their towels off after the shower so he could check to make sure they were clean. But he did it in a group. So these kids are thinking, well, if these other kids are being touched in the classroom or at the camp and they're not saying anything, then this must be expected behavior and I'm not supposed to say anything either. So they kind of watch to see how other kids react especially in situations where there's a clear authoritative figure. So those are different and unique scenarios, but they can happen also. Um, so with this, sometimes it's a demonstration of abuse of power and victim helplessness. You know, I think to some extent what happened with the Sandusky case reflects this. You know, they were in the shower. Somebody saw what happened, but then nothing happened. And so I can imagine what's going on in that victim's mind is, so why do I bother telling? This guy saw what happened and everybody's going on as if nothing happened. And if other victims were to learn about that lack of response, how that would also reinforce them staying quiet. Does that make sense to you? It's a complex scenario, but you can understand how in that group situation they might process it differently. Um, there's also the lack of uh, escape possibility. So this boy at camp, for example. He was sexually abused. He was being touched by his camp counselor. And he lived 200 miles away. Okay? So when this happened, he was very uncomfortable with it. And his response was, you know, when you're at camp, sometimes you can't use phones or no phones or anything. So he wrote a letter to his parents saying, I hate it here. Come get me. And the parents got this letter, and they were very upset by it. So they called the camp and said, we need to talk with our son. He's not doing well. He's very upset. He doesn't want to be there. So what do they do? They hand him the phone in the middle of the cafeteria with everybody else there. No, Mom, everything's fine. I'm sorry. He is terribly embarrassed by the whole scenario. So of course he doesn't tell his parents on the phone. But then the question becomes this. When his parents come at the end of the six weeks and pick him up, and drive him 200 miles away home, why didn't he tell them? He's safe. He's away from the situation. Why didn't he tell them? And I encourage the prosecutor to ask the child that question on the stand, because I thought it was key for people to hear his answer. And his answer was this. I didn't want to disappoint my parents. My mom had always told me, if anything happened to me that I didn't like, or anything like this, if they touched me, I needed to call 911. I needed to tell right away. And I didn't. And I couldn't face my parents when they realized I didn't do what they taught me to do all my life. That disappointment was way too much for him. He outcried in therapy several months later. Several months later. So, you know, even in scenarios we expect them to tell, they don't always. 